If you got your copy of God's Word, would you turn with me to Luke chapter 17? And as you turn to Luke chapter 17, I, I want to um, I want to take a couple minutes to maybe point out three things that have been common throughout this series that we've been in. We've been in a series looking at the miracles of Jesus, not only looking at Christ's work in the region of Galilee and Palestine and Samaria, but also looking at how his work directly impacts us. And as I was kind of studying for this week, um, I was thinking about three things that have been really apparent and clear throughout this entire series. Uh, The first thing is that Jesus always, almost always, initiates. When you see Jesus coming to the people that we've seen, that we've looked at, that we've examined, it is Christ coming to them to initiate with them. It's Christ essentially running to broken people, and that is a good word for me, a broken and frail man. I think the second thing that I've noticed is that uh, while physical healing is really important, uh, I think Jesus, there's something else going on. Jesus wants to point their eyes to an eternal, to a spiritual reality. So while physical healing is sometimes just the doorway to a more substantial, holistic healing, and that is a spiritual healing, calling men and women into the kingdom of his Father. And then third, all these miracles concern themselves with one primary thing, and that is faith. Uh, Here in just a moment, we're going to be uncovering faith in our text in Luke chapter 17. We'll begin in verse 11 through 19. But we see faith being this thing that Jesus wants to engender in all of his people because, after all, the the kingdom of God is a spiritual kingdom, not a physical kingdom. At least it's spiritual right now. It'll be physical in a little while. But Jesus wants to show them that faith is the doorway into this kingdom. So we see three things. Jesus initiates. We see physical healing is one aspect of Jesus' ministry. He's teaching about a physical and a spiritual reality. And faith is the doorway into that spiritual reality. So this morning we turn our attention to Luke chapter 17. We'll be in verses 11 through 19. Luke chapter 17, verse 11 reads, On the way to Jerusalem, he, Jesus, was passing along between Samaria and Galilee. And as he entered a village, he was met by ten lepers who stood at a distance and lifted up their voices, saying, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. And when he saw them, he said to them, Go and show yourselves to the priest." And as they went, they were cleansed. Then one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back, praising God with a loud voice. And he fell on his face at Jesus' feet, giving him thanks. Now he was a Samaritan. Then Jesus answered, were not ten cleansed? Where are the nine? Was no one found to return and give praise to God except this foreigner? And he said to him, Rise and go your way. Your faith has made you well. This is the word of the Lord. And before considering it, we should pray. So let's pray. Lord Jesus, every week you hear my cries out to you for help. Particularly in this event where I am charged by you to speak on your behalf. And we as your people have gathered to hear from you. But Lord, I am too tempted to get in the way. We are people easily distracted, drawn away from the most beautiful thing by things here on this planet that really don't make that big a difference. They're not that important this morning. God, we need your help. So would you come, Lord Jesus, and would you illuminate us, Holy Spirit, illuminate our minds to understand, our hearts to receive, our eyes to perceive and discern those things which are of utmost importance. Holy Spirit, you are the hand that penned the words on these pages. Would you please be our exegetical escort? this morning causing us to dance doxologically so that we might ultimately be renewed and transformed into your image. 
Jesus, we pray these things in your name and for your sake. Amen. Amen. September 12, 2004 will go down in history as one of the greatest days in daytime television history. On September 14th, September 12th, rather, 2004, there was a young lady who grew up in Kosciuszko, Mississippi, who now found herself to be the host of the most popular daytime television show in America. Her name is Oprah. And on September 12, 2004, Oprah didn't just give away one vacation. She gave everyone in the crowd cars. Now, my wife loves Ellen. Ellen is the new Oprah. But Ellen gives away a whole lot more stuff than Oprah. But every episode of Ellen that I watch with my wife, which is very not often, in fact, I kind of find reasons to run out of the room when she's watching, there is something that is common when you watch videos of 200 people receiving a brand new car, and when you watch videos of Ellen giving a Shutterfly uh, a scholarship to a kid to go to college, there is something that is congruent in both of those images. Ten years apart, different cities, different women, but the sentiment is the same. It's a sentiment of excitement and gratitude. I find that when I watch people that are given large gifts, that the gratitude they express is unlike anything that you normally see. If I were to give you a piece of gum, you might say, hey, Jason, well, that's great. Thanks so much, brother. But if I were to come to you and I were to say, hey, aren't you in about $700,000 worth of debt? Uh, What if I were to write a check right now to pay that debt for you? You would be aghast. You would be tearful. You would be so grateful that you would spend the rest of your life trying to pay for what had just been done for you. In this pericope, in this passage, uh, we find Jesus encountering 10 lepers, and of those 10, there is one who expresses great and deep gratitude. So this morning... The question I have for you, fellowship, is this. How grateful are you for what Christ has done on your behalf? I wonder if if you get misty-eyed sometimes thinking about the work of Jesus on your behalf. I wonder if you would pause and stop in the middle of your day and give thanks to God, or is it just an intermittent exercise only when the doors of the church are open. I wonder how grateful you are for the things that you have when you consider the rest of the world lives on approximately three dollars a day. We in America who see poverty, what we would deem abject poverty, are rich compared to the rest of the world. I wonder how grateful we are. But moreover, when Jesus does something really amazing. He answers a prayer. He spares your life. He allows your children to meet great friends. He blesses you with things. How grateful are we? This morning, I hope to prove to you and argue this morning that faith And is the only means to be truly grateful, but also gratitude is the proper response of those who are redeemed. We turn our attention first to verses 11 through 13. And 11 through 13, we find Jesus walking through Samaria and Galilee. He's entered a village. He meets 10 lepers. He stands at a distance. They cry out to him, and he says to them, go show yourself to the priests. And in order to understand these first couple of verses, we've got to back up and we need to understand a and have a working definition for faith. What is faith? We know that without faith, it's impossible to please God. We walk by faith and not by sight. The Hebrews 11 is the hall of faith. These men and women throughout history, throughout time who have been faithful in God. But what exactly is faith? If I can go back to Christianity 101, allow me to explain faith, and hopefully this will illuminate how we see the rest of our text. So everyone can see my eyeballs, right? Can you see my eyeballs? Everyone sees my eyeballs? Okay, everyone in here can see my eyeballs. This will be a very 
a great time for a really poor and just not very tactful joke concerning uh, those of the likes of Ray Charles or Stevie Wonder, but I will refrain. Uh, by the way, this has nothing to do with anything. There's a, apparently a rumor going around that Stevie Wonder is not really blind. Have y'all seen that? You should really check it out. It's kind of done in poor taste. Anyway, I, I digress. Our eyes, our eyeballs, our eyeballs are the physical organ by which we perceive things and know them to be true. So I see you, I see your chairs, I see the clock, I, I see this room, I see the lights. Therefore, if I see those things physically, that means those things must exist. It means they must be true. Now, here's the problem with Christianity is because we believe in a God that we cannot readily see with these eyes. And so what God does in his immense providence is that he gives us Faith, and faith is essentially the spiritual eyes by which we are given to perceive spiritual things. So if our physical eyes, if our physical eyesight allows us to see physical things, then faith is essentially our spiritual eyeballs to perceive those things which are spiritual. Faith then is not a blind hope. It's not a blind jumping. It's not carelessly jumping into the whim of some unknown, it is, it is concrete evidence and proof through spiritual eyeballs that God is exactly who he says he is. So faith then, if we're considering faith in the context of this passage, but faith then is an earthly endeavor. I wonder if you've ever thought about why we sing the line of that hymn, Lord, haste the day when our faith be made sight. The reason is because you won't need faith in heaven. Heaven is the place where faith won't exist. You know why? Because when we get to heaven, we will have spiritual eyes to perceive that which is spiritual. So God becomes real. He becomes illuminated to us because now we have the proper mechanism, the proper organ to see God. Likewise, faith on this terrestrial ball is the organ by which we see God. And that is what propels these men to cry out to Jesus. They are in a leprous colony, exiled not only from the fellowship of believers, they're exiled from the community, they're exiled from the city. They're somewhere in between Samaria and Galilee, which there's not a whole lot there. These men are desperate. The situation is horrible. And faith that this man... Jesus can save them is indicative by them calling out and saying, Jesus, master, mm, master, have mercy on us. Their faith is crying out. It's evident. But then Jesus answers with a very strange thing. I, I sometimes get real puzzled by the way Jesus answers cries for help. He meets a demoniac. As Ricky preached on, he meets a demoniac. The demoniac cries out for help. And what does he do? He doesn't simply cast out the demons, but he casts out demons and puts them in pigs. Or Jairus' daughter is dying. He goes to Jesus and says, Jesus, help a brother out. And Jesus is like, nah, pimp, hang on one second. I got, I got this other daughter I need to take care of. Jesus' answers to our cries are very rarely what we expect. So when Jesus hears the cries, his first answer is not, my son, you're good, I got you. His first answer is, go and show yourself to the priests. Now, hold on, wait a minute, Jesus. Go and show yourself to the priests? You know I can't go talk to that brother. According to the Old Testament law, if you had leprosy, which is not simply, it's not only boils on the skin like abscesses on the skin. It's really any kind of skin disease, anything from abscesses to eczema. And if you were cleansed of that skin disease, only after you were cleansed could you go to the priest and the priest could put his stamp of approval on you and say you are now fit to be welcomed back into the community of believers. Jesus tells these men to go and holler at the priest before they're healed. Why would Jesus tell them to go see a priest before they're healed? It's because Jesus is trying to engender faith in them. You see, here's the thing about faith. Faith actively seeks to obey the words of Jesus. 
Faith, if it does not actively seek to obey the words of Jesus, it is not faith. Go show yourself to the priest. Well, Jesus, I'm not healed yet. Then you don't really believe me and take me at my word. You want what I can offer you. You want my gifts, but you don't want me. You want my blessing. You want the transaction, but you don't want a relationship. Again, I say to you, go show yourself to the priest. Faith is active. I want you to know that, let me say this. There are a lot of people who will say to you, who will say to me, Jason, as a pastor, they'll come to me and they say, Jason, I've not read my Bible in three months because I haven't had the right motivation or I haven't had the right heart behind it, that it's, it's become just a spiritual exercise and I'm not receiving much nourishment from it. Or Jason, I haven't prayed in a long time because I feel like when I pray, I'm just going through the motions and I feel like I'm just doing something out of routine. And that is a reason justifiably so for them to stop engaging with God. I want you to hear me carefully. Those things are common. But you also cannot overlook the good of them. If we waited for our motivation to be proper before we did anything for God, my friends, we would never do anything for him. And if we waited for the proper motivation to read God's word or to pray, we would never read it. We would never pray because our motivation is almost never correct. Faith that is not active in obeying the word of God is not Faith, if you are not reading your Bible or praying or engaging in evangelism or loving God because your heart is not in it, you forget that God works in everything. That even you reading your Bible for five minutes because your heart's not in it is good for your soul. These men could not understand Jesus' words and telling them, go see the priest, but they took him at his word. And so for us, we may not always see what God is doing, but we must take him at his word. Faith propels us, I like this, faith propels us to obey even when it doesn't make sense. Faith propels us to obey even when it doesn't make sense. I grew up uh, first half of my life in Birmingham, second half of uh, my uh, underling years in Atlanta, Georgia in a suburb, and I went to a predominantly white high school. But from time to time, we would get together, and the folks in my school would have a BPP, which we referred to as a black people party. And it was only black people that would get together. We need each other. I'm saying, you know, it's hard living in, living in a world by yourself sometimes, and so we need each other. We would come together, and we would play songs of the Three Six Mafia type, and we would play songs of the Lil John and the East Side Boys type, and this is, of course before I really understood what holiness and grace was, so y'all have to forgive me. But my mom asked me one night, she said, son, where are you going? My brother and I, and I think I lied to her, I told her we were going to a friend's house. Little did I know, uh, little did she know we were going to a black people party. And, and my mom had always warned us about going to parties. And I used to, always, used to always think my mom was just this buzzkill. Mom, you don't want us to have fun. You don't really want us to have fun at all. So what did my brother and I do? We lied and we went to this party anyway. So we get to this party, and everything is good. People start filing in, and it was all good and fine until they played the one song that always causes problems whenever there are large groups of African Americans, or at least at this time in the early 2000s, and that song was Nuck If You Buck. (laughs) If you don't know that song, many of you... (laughs) If you don't know that song, just know when that song is played, it jumps off. So, of course, the song strikes up and Nuck If You Buck begins to play. And all of a sudden, a hundred teenagers start losing their minds. Next thing you know, there's fights breaking out. 
And as the fights break out and people are thrown off of each other, I'm looking around in horror, thinking to myself, man, why am I here? Well, a buddy of mine's fighting. I pull him out of the fray. I take him outside. We get outside, and they're mad at me for breaking up this fight. So a young man behind me pulls a Glock 40 out of his waistband, and he cocks it, and he puts it in my face before raising it up in the air and firing off three shots. I've never been more terrified in my life. I thought I was going to die. 17 years old, I thought I was going to die. Get home, then later on that night, didn't sleep a wink, shaking all night. I passed my mom in the morning. She asked, hey, how, how was last night? And I wanted to lie. I wanted to lie to her and say, oh, everything was fine. But you know mamas know everything anyway, so I just broke down and boo-hooed and started crying, and I told her everything that happened, and she said, you know, you may not know, you may not understand why I tell you the things that I tell you, but it's because I love you. And I think in like fashion, we may not always understand why Jesus does something or why the word tells us to obey or why we must go where we cannot see, but if you could see everything in your spiritual life, then faith would have no benefit to us. Just like my mother, and even in a greater fashion, God it calls us to places sometimes that we can't see. You know why? Because if you could see what was ahead, you would not trust him. You would trust yourself. So faith actively seeks to obey. I think what faith also does is faith closes a distance. Look at verses 15 and 16. Uh, So he says, go to show yourselves to the priests. As they went, they were cleansed. As they were walking to the priests, one man looks down and he says, oh my goodness, oh my God, I am healed. Uh, But what's interesting to me here is that the demarcation in verse 16 at the very end, the demarcation here is now he was a Samaritan. Uh, Why that additional note? Uh, The region between Samaria and Galilee is the region between Gentile Samaria and Jewish Galilee. It's a region of in-betweenness. And Jesus, presumably speaking to these men, when he says go and see the priests, he's probably talking to Jews here. So why are Jews in the same place as Samaritans. Samaritans were inbred. They were called the dogs. So this man whom Jesus heals, this man, a Samaritan, is doubly unclean. He's not only a dog, he's a Samaritan, but he's also a leper. Uh, If he had a chance being a Samaritan, he has no chance being a Samaritan and a leper. But what's interesting to me is that these Jews and Samaritans are in the same place. Why are they together? I believe it's because brokenness has bound them together as brothers. There is a camaraderie that comes with suffering. And last week, as you all prayed in this room, as we watched what's happened in our nation, as we continue to fight and strive, that those who are broken have a camaraderie that's built between them. It's one of the beautiful things about this church. And it's one of the things that I pray continues to be the undercurrent heartbeat of this church is that entering into the brokenness of one another, whether or not you had a young son that was killed or whether you uh, have improper finances and you're embezzling money and you need somebody to tell you it's gonna be okay, whatever that looks like, we enter into the brokenness with one another. When two parties realize that they come from two completely different worlds, but their suffering has bound them together. There is a camaraderie that is built. And this is important because as you might recall in Philippians 3, Paul says that I want to know Christ and I want to share in his sufferings. Why does Paul seek camaraderie with Jesus? It's because Paul finds himself in the same desperate situation that Jesus found himself on the cross. 
For the Christian, for the believer, it is brokenness that binds us together. And it's not just what hood you from or what family you came from, but it's the brokenness of sin. Every last single one of you and me at one point in time was doubly unclean. Every single last one of you was not only born into sin and iniquity, but continued with like compounding interest to uh, uh, raise the level of sinning. But yet along comes Jesus and he saves us. This is why the church is so important. It must be a place that people are bound by brokenness as brothers and sisters. But don't miss this. This doubly unclean man. Where is he when we first meet him? We first meet him and Jesus is calling off from a far away. They're crying out from a far away, Jesus, master, come save us. And then where do we find him in verse 17 and 18? We find him at the feet of Jesus. You see, the beautiful thing about this man is he's an object lesson to us that faith closes the distance. It closes the distance between us and Jesus. There is a proximity here that leads to intimacy. (laughs) This doubly unclean man was far off, but because of the work of Christ, he's been brought near. I don't know if y'all ever read Ephesians 2, but Paul says that such were some of you. You were far off. You were exiles. You were outside the covenant of God. You were outside the promises of God with no God and without hope. But then we get that Sir Mix-a-Lot moment. And but God, (laughs) but God has brought us near. He's reconciled us by the blood of his cross. My friends, this story of this leper is our story. This is our song that we were doubly unclean, that we were far off, that we were away from the promises of God. And by the work of Christ, he has brought us near. Now we're afforded with a proximal and an intimate relationship. Faith that obeys, that trusts, and believes fosters intimacy between us and Jesus. Throughout scripture, who does Jesus identify the most with? Is it the power elite? Is it those who are wealthy? Is it the popular crew? Or is he called the man of sorrows for a reason because he's attracted to brokenness? You see, I think sometimes we treat our relationship with God more like a a business transaction than an intimate relationship. God to us is more like an ATM than he is a father. And maybe you only know your earthly father as an ATM, but God is so much more than that. Because when we go to God, it's not just an exchange of goods. These lepers, nine of them treated their relationship with Jesus like an ATM. They said, okay, Jesus, here's my leprosy. Okay, you give me healing? Okay, cool, great, I'm out. Uh, That was a great deal for us, Jesus. Wasn't that wonderful? But there was only one who said, Jesus, I bring you my leprosy. I bring you my brokenness. And in return, you heal me. This is not simply a transaction. What you've just done for me demands my entire life. Nine of them run off probably never make it to the priest, and one of them is at the feet of Jesus who's bound to him forever. Uh, God doesn't send his only son to die for us so that we might simply be partakers of his blessing, but that we might be partakers of himself. And I want you to hear me very closely. There are some Christians who think that heaven and God are only small prizes compared to the material things we have on this earth. And when we consider the grandeur of heaven and the majesty of God, it seems a gift too small. But my friends, I would say to you is that you have not yet considered how mighty and grand God is. If a relationship with God is secondary to the things you get from God, then you have no idea who he is. God is 
quite literally the most magnificent being in all of the universe. Matchless in power, in scope, in righteousness. He has no equal in love, in loyalty, in mercy. He is in a category all his own when it comes to his own sustainability, to his character, to his knowledge, to his wisdom. This is who we get. The same God who invented the emotion love and the same God who invented the duckbill platypus. The one who hangs stars and nebulas in the sky, who dwells in unapproachable light, who even angels have to hide their face to see. We get to know him. This is the preciousness of God. This is the intimacy that's afforded to us. And as long as we see our relationships with God as conditional, if you do this for me, then I'll do that for you. My friends, you miss out on the most amazing gift that has ever been offered to you, and that is God. There was one leper who said, Jesus, you're worth it. You are more important to me than my healing. Praising you and being at your feet is more important to me than being with the rest of those knuckleheads. Right now, the only thing that matters to me is you. I brought you my leprosy and you healed me. I was unclean and you cleansed me. I was broken and you restored me and I'm a Samaritan. You have a reputation, Jesus, and yet you associate with me? To which Jesus replies, my reputation means nothing compared to what you mean to me. So he's on his face, praising the name of Jesus. And he's grateful. Faith engendered within us creates intimacy with God. Last couple of verses, verses 17 through 19, we find faith producing gratitude. And I want you to know that uh, whenever I read the Bible, I sometimes not only ask myself, what is this text saying? But I also ask myself, what would be missing if this text were not in here? And so when I look at this, I see that if we do not have a lesson on being grateful, we will be ungrateful people. And I was thinking this week that ungratefulness leads to entitlement. And not just in like the sense of millennials that many people think are entitled to things that they didn't work for or earn, but entitlement in the sense that, God, you had to save me. Do you not know where I grew up? Do you not know where my parents were? You had to save me. So my relationship with you is going to be one wherein it's, of course you've got to be with me. Of course your presence must dwell with me. Of course you had to come save me. Of course you think of me as as beautiful. There's an entitlement that comes here. Entitlement, quite simply, is the belief that one is inherently deserving of special treatment. Being ungrateful will lead to entitlement, and it will lead to you missing out on the fact that your relationship with God is a gift, a great gift, once in which none of us paid to deserve, one in which there was no reason outside of the grace of God to give to us. And I wonder if you've ever heard that on that day at Calvary, on that hill, there were two thieves on the cross. I submit to you this morning that there were three thieves on that cross, and the one in the middle, he took my sin. There was one on his left, there was one on his right, and the thief in the middle stole my sin. Not because of anything that I'd ever done, but because of he saw me and loved me. He sees you. He loves you. My friends, we have much to be grateful for. We stand on the work that we did not help to build or create. 
We are recipients of grace that we did nothing to merit or earn. That when it comes to being grateful, that gratitude is the proper response and an important mark of the redeemed life. I wonder if you remember that old hymn, My Sin, Oh the Bliss, of that glorious thought. My sin, not in part, but the whole, is nailed to a cross, and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, oh my soul. <laughs> when I think we sing these words, they just kind of fall empty on our hearts and our minds, but we have much to be grateful for. Grateful that Jesus saw us doubly unclean people and he healed us anyway. Grateful that he hears our prayers. Grateful that even when my motivations are improper, Lord, that your grace covers them all. And I'm grateful that blessed is the man whose sin the Lord will never hold against him. There was a whole crowd of people in the audience in Oprah's show that day who were very grateful for cars. And they erupted in rancorous exaltation and gratitude for what had been done. How much more do we have to be grateful for? We get God. And that is a matchless gift. Let's pray. Father in heaven, forgive us when our views and our thoughts of you are too small. Forgive us when we've lost our awe and wonder of you and we treat you as common. And Father, renew within us a sense of awe and wonder that would restore unto us just how precious you are. And Lord, I pray that you would engender within us gratitude, that Fellowship Memphis would be the most grateful group of people because we recognize we were doubly unclean and you saved us. You not only healed us physically, but you saved us spiritually. And I pray that the words of our mouth and the work of our hands would give testament and praise and honor to that. And so now, Lord, as we come to your table, I pray that you would show us yourself, and I pray that we would pour our gratitude out to you in remembering what you've done for us on our behalf. Lord Jesus, we love you and we thank you. It's your name we pray. Amen.